reform. But first, understanding the intricacies, impact, and importance of President Nelson Mandela. I pledge to use all my strength and ability to live up to your expectations. We are going forward. Our march to freedom is irreversible. We must not allow fear to stand in our way. Good morning. I'm Melissa Harris Perry. And the world lost one of its greatest leaders and agents of social change with the passing of Nelson Mandela at the age of 95 on Thursday. Madiba, the clan name by which Mandela was affectionately known, transcended the boundaries of South Africa as it became synonymous with the country's greatest struggles and triumphs. Mandela meant many things to many people, including President Obama, who offered this tribute shortly after Mandela's death. For now, let us pause and give thanks for the fact that Nelson Mandela lived, a man who took history in his hands and bent the arc of the moral universe towards justice. No one can deny the indelible contributions and sacrifices that Nelson Mandela made for the people of South Africa and ultimately the world. But often, when a great leader passes on, what we think we know about that person and the truth become two different things. After death, the legacies of great leaders are often usurped and purged of any imperfection. This is exactly what happened with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. His contributions are often confined to racial equality battles when his message was in fact much larger than that. Remember, it wasn't just the March on Washington, it was the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. King's own economic message of a radical redistribution of wealth was not well received and at the end of his life, King was not a national hero. He was reviled. And in his family life, King was far from perfect. His interpersonal failings and infidelities and at times intellectual dishonesties are well documented but frequently expunged from public memory. King's image, his words and his legacy have been appropriated by those whose policies he would have opposed. And even those who stand firmly in King's tradition, for them, the tendency is often to remember the man and the movement of which he was a part as sanitized and glorified rather than as messy and complex and human. The story of how Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. has been misremembered in the U.S. context is a cautionary tale this week. In the wake of Nelson Mandela's death, it is important that we remember him as a man, as a human, and not as a myth. He is not an icon free of imperfection, and to insist on transforming him into one is a disservice to Mandela and to ourselves. Because we cannot learn the lessons of Mandela without knowing his story. What made Mandela great is his humanity. And humanity is messy. Always. While the popular narrative only includes Mandela's adoption of change through nonviolent methods, before he was arrested, Mandela himself wrestled with nonviolent direct action versus armed insurrection against the evils of apartheid. In a 1961 interview with the ITN, before he was arrested, Mandela had this to say. There are many people who feel that it is useless and futile for us to continue talking peace and nonviolence against a government whose reply is only savage attacks on an unarmed and defenseless people. And I think the time has come for us to consider, in the light of our experiences in this day at home, whether the methods which we have applied so far are adequate. That struggle between armed and unarmed resistance was a sentiment that he echoed both during his 1964 trial and once he was released from prison in 1990 when he spoke about the ideal of a democratic and free society it is an ideal which i hope to live for and to achieve but if needs be it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. 
And during his brief but historic tenure as president, Mandela proved that South Africa would not simply automatically follow the whims of the global community. It would set its own course. In 1997, he told Washington leaders that their desire to influence African foreign policies was arrogant and racist. And he said Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi, an international pariah at the time, was his friend. So Mandela went right ahead and visited Gaddafi in Tripoli. Mandela was also friends with Fidel Castro. Mandela visited him after he was released from prison in 1990 and embraced the Cuban leader because of his support to end apartheid, even while the rest of the world shunned Castro for his communist dictatorship. In 2003, Mandela joined those who were against the U.S.-led war against Iraq and not only called it a tragedy, but said, what I am condemning is that one power with a president who has no foresight, who cannot think properly, is now wanting to plunge the world into a holocaust. For those who will only see Mandela as the gentle saint, remember it was he himself who said, I am no angel. Instead, he was complex, imperfect, and human. And we do Mandela's memory more justice when we remember the entire man. Joining me this morning, Mark Quarterman, Research Director for the Enough Project, which works to end genocide and crimes against humanity. Amy Goodman, host and executive producer of Democracy Now! Khalil Mohammed, who is director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. And Marcus Mabry, who is the editor of the Breaking News blog, the lead for the New York Times, who formerly served as the Johannesburg South Africa Bureau Chief for Newsweek. Thanks so much to all of you for being here. Mark, I want to start with you because you actually spent some time living in South Africa um, before the end of apartheid and then some time uh, thereafter. And it seems to me that when we think about Mandela, there are sort of at least five Mandelas. I don't want you to go through all of them. But there's, you know, there's Mandela before Robben Island. There's the Mandela of Robben Island. There's Mandela 1990. There's Mandela as president. And then there is the Mandela after the presidency. If you can just sort of think about that trajectory, what are the key things we need to know about that Mandela in terms of the context of the South African struggle against apartheid. Well, I, I think you made a really good point before about how we, we defang or maybe make into teddy bears these great leaders um, and, and pick out one or two things. Uh, uh, Mandela's reconciliation when he became president, for example. And then act as if, um, uh, secondly, act as if that one great leader was the person who did that. And we have to understand that the African National Congress was based on non-racialism. I mean, its core document, the Freedom Charter, the first thing it says of South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white, and no government can justly claim authority unless based on the will of all the people. So when Nelson Mandela became president, it wasn't as if he decided either as, as, as a, a warmly humane person to, to reconcile mm -hmm. or as a, a, a savvy political leader realizing that the only way to do it is reconciliation. He was following the Freedom Charter from 1955. He participated in the conference, but he wasn't the leader of it. Mm. He, he embodied the ANC's approach the ANC's mm -hmm. uh, 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 principles, um, but he wasn't the only one. And, and during my time in South Africa, especially in the, in the late 80s, when apartheid was, uh, still existed, um, I met any number of South Africans, leaders, um, rank and file, who had been through terrible injustice. Mm -hmm. uh, fellow graduates of Robben Island, for example. Yep. Um, people who had been tortured or under banning orders. And almost to a person, I, I heard similar words from them that we heard from, South, that from, from Nelson Mandela after he was released from prison. And in many ways, my love for South Africa and my inspiration from South Africans came from those years when Mandela was still in prison, mm -hmm. when we didn't even know what he looked like because right. there was only one old picture. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, he, 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 he was the, the leader. He mm -hmm. was, he was the, the avatar of the movement. But there's much, much more. And he was standing on a firm base, firm foundation. About this. And, and, and Khalil, you know, it's been surprising, Mark, you know, on the one hand, um, this effort to sanitize Mandela that we're seeing now that, you know, that again, that I was trying to make this kind of claim around King. And yet also, and this is maybe even more surprising to me this week, this desire to go back and say, well, you know, at one point he talked about violence. I mean, he was thinking about violence. I mean, violence. And I'm thinking, we are talking about resistance to apartheid. Violence was true. And he was talking about whether or not there should be armed resistance or unarmed resistance. But violence was already being perpetuated by the system. Right. We often think of violence as uh, the 
problem of the oppressed, mm -hmm. not the problem of the oppressor. Right. And what's interesting about Mandela, to come back to an earlier point about his evolution, is that he was in some ways um, accidentally privileged by being able to get a missionary education. Um, and he, he started out life essentially with a tremendous sense of self-confidence inspired by his local community. And to take him from that position, which makes him an aspiring lawyer um, by his early 30s, he's already rising the ranks of the ANC, only marks the ways in which he evolved as an individual. And I think we have to hold that in place because he lived so long that he was able to draw on so many strains of thought. So yes, he went through a period where he embraced Africanism mm -hmm. or black nationalism to a point where the notion of race first of, in the tradition of a Marcus Garvey in the United States, for example, this notion that black people have to solidify. And yes, the ANC, there was tension there, yes. this right? Is, this, so, is, this is such a great Point yes. that he lives he lives to be nearly 100 years old his trajectory for change is very different than that of a king who is assassinated while still a young man Amy I want to ask you one quick question here and then I promise we'll do more after the break not only do we misremember Mandela we misremember ourselves in relationship to Mandela we now say oh America always embraced the anti-apartheid movement what are the parts of our own story that we're getting wrong and Melissa that is a key point I mean the US devoted more resources to finding Mandela to hand over to the apartheid forces mm -hmm. than the apartheid forces themselves it was the CIA that actually located Mandela uh, and he was driving uh, dressed up as a chauffeur when he was stopped and uh, he was arrested and ultimately ultimately serves 27 years in prison. Uh, that is the key point. Mm -hmm. I mean, just as the U.S. government is surveilling today, they were surveilling back then. Yeah. And then, and we'll talk more about grassroots activism, how important it was that ultimately the U.S. supporting Mandela and the ANC uh, came so much later. Yep. In yep. 2008, he was taken off the terror watch list. This is 14 years <sighs> after he was president of yes. South Africa. He's taken off of the U.S. terror watch list. That, that point I want to return to as we come back because I do think we have also sanitized sort of our notion oh of course we were always against apartheid when in fact not true and Marcus I promise I'm gonna get you in as soon as we get back but right now we're gonna take a quick break and up next why one of the most important things that Nelson Mandela did was a thing that he did not do <laughs> The time for the healing of the wounds has come. The moment to preach the chasms that divide us has come. The time to build is upon us. That was Nelson Mandela during his 1994 inauguration speech. Marcus, what did Mandela see as his key role, his primary responsibility in the presidency? Uh, he saw it as reconciliation. He saw it as transitioning South Africa from this country that could have exploded into a violent racial all-out war, civil war, uh, to a country that was actually feasible, a country that could actually be a part of the world community, a, a country that could actually stay together. He knew about the resentments. Um, one of the things you were saying earlier about how we deify Mandela at his peril and our own, and indeed at history's peril, he, it was not that Mandela was not a bitter man. He was very bitter. Hmm. He was very hurt. He was very angry. Mandela realized, however, that leadership was not about what he felt or how he felt. It was all about the struggle and about the legacy. He did what, what he, we never saw what he felt. <clears throat> one of the few times I remember when I was bureau chief for Newsweek in the country and he was president, one of the few times we saw what he felt and talking about how human it was, was when he was uh, in the middle of his divorce from Winnie, mm -hmm. Madikizela Mandela. And when he got on the stand, he said, explaining his re request for the divorce, that he had no physical affection from his wife after he left prison and how he was the loneliest man in the world. Mm -hmm. This is not a deity. This right. is not someone above all human emotion. Yes. But that's the only time we felt the reality of the personal feelings of Mandela. It was never about that. He felt that was indulgent. So you can imagine, you know, you talk about great leaders, right? And the difference between some of our more 
contemporary American leaders and Nelson Mandela who believe that you deny the personal. That's what leadership is about. So, so this, I want to, I want to push on this a little bit. And, and any of you on this one? So this is interesting to me that, he, that this man who sees himself as not the, the key or central issue, even as you were saying, Mark, that he's part of this tradition, and yet sees reconciliation as the primary goal. I wonder if there's a missed moment there. I, so on the one hand, I, like my heart leaps at the idea of, of truth and reconciliation. Mm. But then I also think to myself, why not have the primary goal be radical economic redistribution for the evils of apartheid? What would that agenda have looked like? But I think, I think Tutu answered it best, because Tutu said, uh, when I talked about the truth and reconciliation process itself, where people uh, revealed the horrible things, at least some, many of the horrible things that they did during apartheid to, to mostly keep Africans down, and, and, you know, and horrible, disgusting things we can even imagine today, that we're a part of that system, that we're all unseen until the truth and reconciliation process. What Tutu said was, when people, I talked about how people didn't find that fulfilling. The victims of apartheid said, but no one's going to pay a price. This person who did this to my family or to my child uh, will, will come forward, give the facts, and then not be criminally indicted for it. Yep. <clears throat> Tutu said the point was, we didn't win. This was a truce. We didn't win. And I think that is the key to it. You couldn't have all those other things because they didn't win. Mm. I think that that's an absolutely fundamental point because from the time Mandela was released, the ANC was unbanned, until the election, there was a negotiation process. And one of the calculations that, that F.W. de Klerk and the National Party made was that they could win the negotiation process and maintain a degree of, of white control for a longer period. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the ways they set it up was, was a, a, a pre-constitutional negotiation that had all of the homelands there and their leaders represented, um, the African National Congress and others, and the National Party. And the ANC was outnumbered mm -hmm. there. And I, I actually sat in on a number of those sessions. And, and yes, the homeland leaders almost you, all went with the National Party in the beginning. But it was really interesting. There was a shift around 90, in, in 93 when um, uh, the, 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 the homeland base for the National Party began to crumble, mm -hmm. when uh, it, it was absolutely clear that the, that the African National Congress represented the overwhelming majority of the South African mm -hmm. people. And the negotiations broke down to basically the two big parties, the National Party and the ANC, mm -hmm. working things out. And de Klerk and his advisors realized that they weren't going to be able to bum rush some sort of mild transition. Yeah. And but this was, hold on, because I, I want to get to de Klerk as soon as we yeah. get back. I want, I want to talk more on de Klerk and more yeah. on the question of what this transition looked like.